I want to welcome all of you to the grand opening for Thomas Heights. My name is Greg Payne. I'm a development officer at Avesta Housing. Um, as many of you know, uh, there are far too many people in our city who are struggling in this housing environment right now. The, the gap, the housing gap, that exists between the cost of the housing that people need and the incomes that they have has grown so wide that a minimum wage earner needs to work 100 hours a week, 52 weeks a year, to afford an apartment just like one of these on the private market today. And that housing gap is the single biggest reason why over 2,100 different households are right now waiting on waiting lists for one of Avesta's apartments, including, by the way, 108 people who are already waiting for one of the 18 apartments here, which has already you know, just opened up in January. In addition, you know, we had over 3,300 different households call us last year seeking an affordable place to live. Because there are so few resources and such light turnover, we were only able to help about 400. But that same housing gap and the profound harmful effect that it has on the lives of so many people across the state is also what drives practitioners and advocates and policymakers to work so hard to create the affordable housing that every single one of us needs. So when we make forward progress and we have a day like today, where we have 18 new, beautiful, highly energy efficient apartments that are affordable to some of the very people most left vulnerable in this housing market, that's something to recognize and hold up and celebrate. We have a few special guests with us today who are gonna help us do just that. Senator Justin Alphon represents this district. He is a former board member of Avesta Housing, and he was a strong supporter of the housing bond that made this project and so many others like it across the state financially feasible. Senator Alphon, please come on up. So good morning, and I am Justin Alphon. I am proud to be the state senator for most of the city of Portland and it is terrific to see so many faces. I know mostly the reason they're here is not because of me or any of us, but I think it's because of you, Tom. So I, I really do. And, and, and <laughs> So uh, there are uh, a lot of people here, and my job is just to represent, the, to talk about one other state representative here, Drew Gatteen, and Drew Gatteen from Westbrook is here and does an incredible job leading the Health and Human Services Committee, which all of you should really get to know Drew because he's doing incredible work. So, Representative Gatteen. So, great leadership matters, and people say that a lot, but I tell you what, after serving on the board of Avesta for six years, Dana, his development directors, staff, the committed board, they do incredible work. I'm telling you, for the uh, small group of committed citizens that are involved in Avesta, they pull their weight and more. And can I just have a huge applause for Avesta? So finding opportunities to build affordable housing uh, matters wherever you live, but especially in this city. Uh, we just heard some stats, but we know that the cost of living is incredibly high, and we also know the cost of developing is staggering right now. In fact, the story of housing is actually very complicated. I know there's a lot of developers out there, including myself that does some developing, and we all come to these events and we say, wow, this is incredible, how'd this happen? Well, it started with an idea, and that idea hit a roadblock, and then it started with finding a solution to that roadblock, and then it hit another roadblock. But people like Avesta and the committed folks here, every time a roadblock happened, every time a cost overrun happened, every time that something got in the way, they found a solution. And that's why we took you know, a property, a single family property, and turned it into 19 affordable housing units. It's pretty incredible, and it's something that we all should be proud of. So Mission Matters, uh, Avesta since 1972. I wasn't even born in 1972. In 1972, Avesta launched, and, I, and, the, and the launching of Avesta seemed to be pretty remarkable. I think someone should be a storyteller, not me, about that beginning. But they said, we need to do innovation, and we need to do housing, and we need to make it affordable. And they have continued to do that all over Maine and all over New Hampshire. 
We know that affordability right now is uh, something we're all talking about and all struggling with. And you know, a recent national report found the gap between incomes and housing costs in Maine is among highest in the nation. That's kind of remarkable. We think of Maine, the small little place, and we wouldn't think that we would have that ranking, but we do. Uh, it's places like Portland and Southern York County. This gap is particularly bad. Uh, we need to do all we can to build better homes that people can afford, and Thomas Heights is a great example of what we can do together. So um, we know that affordable housing can't be solved by one part of government, and we know that government can't do it all alone either. But when we start looking at what happened with this project, it took local government, state government, and the federal government all coming together with committed private folks and Avesta to make this happen. And that's collaboration. And in a day where a lot of people are thinking about doing it themselves and, and creating this myth about you know pulling up our bootstraps by ourselves, I need them to take a look at Thomas Heights. I need them to look at what happens when you have this collaboration, because this wouldn't have happened alone. It wouldn't have happened with a lot of interested parties saying, we can do better. The state of Maine had a big critical role in this. Uh, in 2009, uh, if people can remember back then, uh, the Green Affordable Housing Bond was approved by the 2009 legislature. It was the single largest source of funding for this project. It shows what an important tool state bonding can be for critical infrastructure problems like housing. So this housing bond, not only did it make that, this project feasible, to ensure 18 local people have access to affordable homes they need, but it also sparked the development of nearly 900 affordable housing units statewide for seniors, families, and those with disabilities. $47 million in green affordable bond housing funds leveraged another 100 million, excuse me, another 100 million in private and public dollars to create a total of $150 million in new development around the state. So investments in affordable housing means jobs for Maine workers. We know that. I mean, in this project alone, it looks like uh, 165 construction jobs happen to make this happen. So those are jobs that people are going home with a great paycheck every single week, and we need more of those paychecks going home. It also means that we're doing other objectives like with Thomas Heights, like focusing on energy efficiency, smart growth principles, and it's something that we all should lift up and really celebrate. So I want to wish the residents of Thomas Heights all the success, happiness that you can find in these beautiful new units. And I also just want to shout out to Tom that your leadership, not only in the city of Portland, but in the state of Maine matters. And not only are you coming up with your strong voice around so many important issues, but you're giving other people the confidence to come up with you and to engage in politics and show off their political muscles just like you. So thank you, Tom. Thanks, Justin. Uh, Portland Mayor Ethan Strimling has made housing of affordability one of his highest priorities. He's also been very deeply involved in these issues for quite some time. We really appreciate his presence with us here today. Please join me in welcoming Portland's Mayor Ethan Strimling. Thank you very much. One of the first acts um, I took as the mayor was to create a task force, a housing task force, because as we all know, certainly in this room, and as I think most people in Portland understand, we have a real crisis around housing in this community. And with that committee, put five councilors on that committee, which means it's a majority of the council, gave it great power to be able to take action. And that committee has been meeting now for the past five or six months but the second thing I did, other than creating that committee, is to appoint the person who I thought was perfect to be able to make this work both intentional and impactful over time. And that person is Councillor Jill Dusan, who's right in the back here. Just want to make sure that um, we acknowledge her work. I, I can't. I really can't emphasize strongly enough her work. She has been incredibly methodical about this, making sure that every step of the way we are doing the due diligence we have to do to get this right. And I know that I think even in this month is when they might actually start moving some pieces off the table uh, to start bringing forward to the council. So pay attention to the committee, but I can assure you they're going to come forward with some very strong proposals to help deal with the crisis. And if you don't understand the crisis, just think about that number of 110. 
110 people right now would like to live in this building who cannot. 110. That means we could have built six more of these and they'd be full right now. That tells you what we are confronting in the city of Portland. Rents have gone up 40% in the last five years. Vacancy near zero. How do, what is a vacancy rate when you have 110 people on a waiting list? It's negative. That's the kind of crisis we're confronting right now and why I'm so proud to be here with Avesta, with the state, with the local community. City of Portland was able to put about half a million dollars into this. As Justin said, the state put in 1.2. Avesta did the hard work. That's the kind of public-private government relationship we want to be able to build the kind of housing that we need in this city to make our city more affordable. So I want to thank Avesta from the bottom of my heart for doing this. I want to thank, I want to appreciate all the tenants who have found a place to live. I know that Avesta understands this work and they look in the eyes of those tenants every day and they know what it means to them, what you have done. So thank you, Avesta, and in particular, thank you, Dana. You don't get enough credit for all the work you do in this city. Thank you. And last but not least, I do want to thank Thomas. Thomas really has done remarkable work. He and I got to chat at the Solstice Vigil last week, and I got to learn a little bit about his background and what he's done for the city. And Dana was telling me a little bit about it as well a couple weeks ago. And uh, people like you make our city great. People like you are turning this city into the kind of place that we all want it to become. Thank you for your commitment. And I think, as Senator Alphonse said, thank you for inspiring people to come with you because that's the best part of this work. So thank you, Thomas, and thank you all for being here today. Thanks, Ethan. I, you know, I do want to say, too, it does make things a lot easier when our elected officials are as supportive as they are at the local, state, and federal level. Um, we do have representatives here from Senator Collins, Senator King, and Representative Pingree's office, too, and I just want to acknowledge the fact that we work closely with them all the time and appreciate their work on these issues. Um, I, I want to take a minute here to acknowledge uh, the, the hard work of the team at Avesta that put this project together and continues to make it work. Um, Shreya Shaw and Todd Rothstein spent many, many months working on the development and construction of this project. And when they were done, they handed the keys over to Charlotte Simpson, who is our day-to-day -day property manager here, and to Shannon McMahon, who oversees the maintenance here. Uh, to Jessica Goodell, who, who does resident service coordination for the 18 people who live here. Um, I do also, um, as Ethan just did, want to recognize the extraordinary leadership um, of um, Dana Totman and the board of directors uh, represented here today by Chumba Kalumba, Carol Billington, Gren Blackall, Rebecca Greenfield, and Peter Bass. Thank you all so much for your ongoing work every day and your leadership. Uh, before we move on to kind of the last part of this program, and uh, I think we can get into um, how we came to name this Thomas Heights, and I know many of you are interested in that. I do also want to recognize some of our key partners who worked with us over the course of years to make this a reality. Um, David Lloyd and Dave Mealy uh, from Archetype Architects did a fantastic job. Sa uh, Simon Hebert from Hebert Construction. Bob Metcalf and Sashi Misner uh, from Mitchell & Associates, our landscape architects. Cito Selinger, our counsel from Curtis Thaxter. Uh, the great team at Boston Capital, represented here today by Jennifer Howard. Um, Corbin Finland's an ongoing part of the work we do, and I don't think um, usually gets much credit for his work day to day. Um, same with Sonia Charest, the construction services um, a person from Maine Housing who, who worked on this project from the get-go. Um, Finally, there's two people I, I was realizing when I was thinking about all this that are always in the background, never get the recognition they really deserve, and I want to call them out here. Um, Rick Churchill um, is the loan officer from Maine Housing who worked on this project, and Mary Davis is the city staff who we worked with so closely. <laughs> You 
You know, I, I think that many of you don't, haven't had the distinct pleasure of trying to get one of these projects to a construction loan closing. Um, or a permanent loan closing. It is not for the faint of heart. There are about a gazillion documents that a gazillion people need to be happy with. There's rules and regulations that never end. There's all sorts of opportunities to make obstacles worse or to create new ones. And that happens sometimes, too much. But what is so nice is that Rick and Mary are solution-oriented people who knock down, help us get past obstacles and don't create them. And I just want to give them a special shout out because they're such good partners and such consistent allies in our work. Thank you both. Um, all right, so when this project reached its construction phase, we really started putting a lot of time and effort into thinking about what we wanted its permanent name to be. Um, we knew we wanted to make special outreach to the veteran community. And, and just to be clear, you don't have to be a veteran to live here. We don't have a preference for veterans in the formal sense of the word preference. But we knew from our work with our partners that there's a whole lot of veterans in this community who've sacrificed so much and don't have the basic necessity of a place to call home. And so we wanted to do all we could with these apartments to help serve them. So as we were thinking about that, we realized what a great opportunity we had to recognize a local veteran who's inspired us and so many others with his efforts to address the causes and conditions of homelessness. Thomas Potasik is a community organizer at Preble Street. He's also a strong and passionate advocate, a leader amongst his peers, and simply a kind, kind person who cares deeply about ending homelessness in our state. To help us with Tom's introduction, I'd like to ask our good friend, Mark Swan, the executive director of Preble Street, to please come on up. So uh, good morning, everyone. What, what we first noticed about Tom Potasik was that he was a voracious reader. When he was struggling with his own homelessness, some days he would sit in the Preble Street day shelter and a little bit set off from the more hectic parts of the room, and he would sit there reading a book. And often his friend and ours, Marsha, would be sitting with him uh, at that table. They'd be swapping stories and getting to know each other, and they became close friends. Marsha Frank, who passed away last year, was like Tom, a veteran of the US Navy. Like Tom, she also experienced unemployment that led to homelessness. And like Tom, she became an advocate with Homeless Voices for Justice. Tom and Marcia together became fierce forces for change. They fought for veterans who served their country, demanding that their country have their backs when times were tough. Tom, I hope you know how very proud Marcia would be of you today and all that Thomas Heights is about. So we learned that Tom is a reader and a learner and is really smart and creates relationships that are meaningful and he is passionate about doing the right thing and saying the right thing. When Tom became housed, he, vo he joined Homeless Voices for Justice and he soon became an important voice that people started listening to. His own life experience of being a veteran who became homeless and his unique power to use language to describe that experience, not only describing the experience, but also conveying, conveying the emotions that accompanied that experience. That was very unique, very powerful, and he moved people. He moved city councilors and state legislators. His words moved the National Commission on Hunger and our U.S. Congress people. Those words moved journalists and reporters police cadets from all over the state of Maine, United Way and other nonprofit social service leaders. And he's also moved, as others have said, perhaps most importantly, other people who are struggling with homelessness. Tom has inspired them to get involved in the social justice movement and to find their own voice. I have to tell you, when we hired Tom as an organizer at Preble Street, we knew how lucky we were. It was a no-brainer for us. 
when Tom speaks, we really, really listen to him. And because of that, we're a better agency for it. Because of his words, we become better social workers, better advocates, and better people. All of us at Preble Street, Tom, are so proud of you and proud to be your colleague. So congratulations. Congratulations to Avesta for this wonderful project and this great day. And I'm now going to introduce the person who actually hired Tom at Preble Street, the former advocacy coordinator at Preble Street, Amy Gallant. Amy? Good morning. It is truly my honor to be here this morning to celebrate this beautiful building, this extraordinary man, and the community many of us calls home. I, like many of you, have attended a number of these celebrations over the years. We come together, as we should, to recognize the accomplishment of a new home. Earlier this month at another opening in South Berwick, Dana reminded us that although Avesta and others are building hundreds of units every year, this is not nearly enough. We need to be doing more. We need to build 10 times more, 100 times more. Together, we must work to build and modify and weatherize homes for veterans and for seniors and for families and for so-called able-bodied adults without dependents and for people who are on the edge of poverty because they are working for jobs with wages too low to pay rent that is too high. I know we will achieve this goal. It may take years, it may take decades, we will reach our collective goal of safe, decent, accessible, truly affordable housing for all Mainers in need because of ceaseless and tireless advocacy by Thomas Potasek and many others. I love the name of this building, Thomas Heights. Well done. Heights make me think inspirational, aspirational, Climbing, struggle, challenge, achievement, success, all of these describe Thomas's journey. As Mainers, many of us know what it is to climb the height of a mountain. Thomas has taught me what it is to climb the mountain of poverty. Thomas has taught me that the mountain of poverty has false summits of hope and the sheer height makes one feel invisible, unseen, and unheard. Too few reach the summit, and not by one's bootstraps, but by real opportunity and support and the community of each one of you who came here today. I tried and failed to choose a single story about Thomas to share with you today. To Thomas, I will simply say squirrels, <laughs> and to the rest of you, I will share this. The single best decision I've made in my career is hiring you, Tom. In closing, I would be remiss if I did not speak to our beloved departed Marsha Frank. Marsha is the reason Thomas and I met all those years ago. Marsha's proudest day was the day she finished boot camp and finally, finally joined the Navy. She described with vivid detail her pride as she wore her dress blues for the very first time, the crease of her pants, the snug fit of those buttons all the way up to her neck, the sound of the military band, the sight of the flag blowing in the breeze. That may have been Marcia's, Marcia's proudest day, but today, this day, would have been a very close second. To Avesta Housing, thank you, congratulations, and well done. To the men and women who call Thomas Heights home today and in the years to come, welcome home, my neighbors. To advocate, organizer, veteran, and my dear friend Thomas Potasek, there are no words. 
and to all of you, with joy and love and pride, I introduce Thomas Potasek. Um, so I, I attempted uh, a lot over the last week to prepare something for this and it did not go well at, at all. There's far, far, far too much to say. So I just simply trusted that these wonderful people would inspire me in a specific direction and, and they have. So the first thing I feel obliged to say is Congratulations to all of you for knowing me. Um, it's, it's, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm apparently quite, quite a person. Um, I, I also want to say that, that in, in trying to prepare something, I learned very quickly that I am not going to thank a single person by name because that just opened up a floodgate that would have me up here for far, far too long. Um, but obviously, I, I want to thank Avesta for this, this incredible honor that um, could not could not be be foreseen for for sure. I was I was talking to a, a friend earlier who who mentioned, you know, you if we'd uh, thought about this or, or mentioned the possibility of this six six years ago. There she is. Hi. <laughs> um, we, uh, we it would have seemed so so improbable. And and I replied by if if you'd uh, mentioned the possibility of this the day before Avesta told me, it would have seemed improbable. Um, so thank you so much for, for really including me in the, the incredible work that, that, that you do, which, which as um, some of you who may not knew coming in now realize is really tough work and, and really, really needed by, by so many people. Um, and then obviously I would like to thank Preble Street for, for helping me to not only uh, return to you know, a, a life of, of normalcy that, in, that included work and, and housing, and, but, but a life of fulfillment. Um, I've, I've mentioned to, to many people that uh, my time as a psychiatric technician when I was in the Navy and working on an inpatient psychiatric ward was the last time that I had done really, truly fulfilling work. Um, and I had, I had forgotten how much that makes me happy and, and fills me with, with pride and, and joy and just a real desire to, to live life. And, and being able to, to reconnect with fulfilling work you know, work, work for in, in, in response to, to crisis and work for, for others to try and create a system that allows them uh, to make the best of, of their lives. And, and that, is what, that is what housing does. Before I forget, though, I am really, really glad that two people mentioned uh, bootstraps because I want to make sure everyone understands that uh, the whole pull yourself up by your bootstraps is, is kind of an American take on something from uh, the man from La Mancha, if everyone's familiar with that story, where he, he pulls himself out of the swamp by his own ponytail. And so that, that phrase is meant to represent something that is impossible, something that is ridiculous. Okay, and so the idea that you pull yourself up by your own bootstraps is ridiculous. It takes. <laughs> and, you know, it, it really does take so much from, from so many people. And I was, I was asked this morning uh, on a radio show that, that Amy and I did 
you know, in that year of homelessness, you know, what, what I had learned about myself. And, you know, I, I replied that I'm not, I'm not sure I really learned a whole lot about myself, but I learned a lot about other people. Um, and it goes so quick that I wasn't really able to expand on that. So I, so I, I will hear. There are, there are so many people doing such good work and working so hard and often against what seem like insurmountable odds. And it, it is just, so, speaking as someone who, who was in that position for a year, it is, it is so beneficial to us. I can't, I can't explain how, how much having, having a, a home to go to uh, played a part in, in my being able to get, to get back to, to a normal and, and fulfilling life. And, you know, I don't have the severe addiction issues that so many people have, and I don't have the severe mental health issues that so many people have. And it still took me a year to get out of the shelter a little over a year to get from getting out of the shelter to connecting with with HVJ and starting on that on that path back and uh, three years with with HVJ before you know I felt comfortable moving moving forward and uh, there there was a, a position there for me that I felt comfortable moving into so if it you know if it's possible for it to take that long for for me we can't expect you know overnight change from so many of the people that that we are working so hard to to help help them improve their lives um obviously hvj and and all the all the organizers uh that i, I think i was with hvj for three years with three different community organizers, um, and and all the all the advocates uh, that I that I worked with, um, and you know what? I'm going to go against what I said, and I, I am going to mention some people by name, and 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 those are those are the the other HVJ advocates that I I had the pleasure to work with uh, those three years, and 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 those that are advocates now. And and uh, Jim Jim Devine I worked with for for several years. Um, Steve Houston, who is who is no longer with us, was um, a big inspiration to me. Marsha Marsha Frank, who who a couple of people have mentioned, obviously is the the reason I even was able to connect with with HVJ. Um, there are Suzanne and and Mike. Uh, are, are two advocates with, with HVJ now that I will have the pleasure working with moving forward. Are there any other advocates that didn't come down to the front that are? Oh, I heard, yeah, I heard D. She's back in the back. D, there, there, is, there, there is no. Oh, is Mary Jo here? Where's Mary Jo? Mary Jo, Mary Jo, awesome. Um, yeah, Mar Mary Jo was was with HVJ the entire time I was I was there, and uh, as was was D. And I I think I was mentioning just the other day how how important you know D was to to me because we we've heard that I'm passionate and kind and understanding and. I certainly am capable of those things. Um, they have not always been my default position, um, but D, D was instrumental in helping me to make compassion and kindness and understanding my default position rather than something that I am merely capable of. Um, so thank you so much for that, D. Um, and so, real briefly, to, to kind of end, just just to talk about what what housing means. Um, and there's a there's a story I like to I like to tell that does not involve squirrels. Um, 
about about my time when I was when I was homeless, and I was about I was about six months into that year, and I was in Monument Square, kind of sitting on a bench, really nice spring day, waiting for the the library to open, and and the library was one 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 corner on what what. Uh, Ashley, the, the last community organizer for HVJ, um, and I believe Donna, loved to talk about my, my triangle of safety, which was Oxford Street Shelter, Preble Street, Library. Within that little triangle is where I felt safe, where I felt comfortable, where I felt I wouldn't be judged. Um, it was, there was too much real life outside of that triangle and and it reminded me of of you know where i had had fallen and how much farther i i had to go and i i felt ashamed outside of that triangle i i felt um like there was just not not maybe not a possibility that i would get back to where i wanted to and that that day sitting on the bench waiting for the library to open I was just watching everyone walk around and everyone do their their work errands and their daily errands and as I said I'm sitting there waiting for the library to open and it I, I had this feeling just kind of out of the blue that was like wow they're all part of a life that I am no longer part of I am not part of that world that is not my world that is that is theirs and and that was the first time that I really felt that that loss prior to that okay I was homeless I was staying in the shelter and it was really horrible and and not that the shelter is horrible because the shelter is great um, but uh, but that was the first time that I really felt like I had lost something and and in that moment I was not sure that it was something I was going to be able to get back and I knew as I'm watching them run their their work in daily errands I had I had lived many years on my own running those same you know work and and personal errands I knew it was quite a mundane thing but I would have given anything to have that mundane existence back and and I wasn't sure that I was going to be able to get it back but it's through it's it's through housing and through mental health services um, and just health services employment services through all these services that we collectively provide that that give people that opportunity to get that back and it can seem very overwhelming I always talk about how when I was sitting there in Preble Street with Marsha and it and that whole voracious reader thing I'm sure was a surprise to my family but when you take a TV away from me it turns out I read um, but so so but I remember I remember thinking that it seems like there are 30 first steps to getting from where I'm at back to where I want to be and there's no physical way to take 30 first steps and and so that's what that's what we do collectively is help people to make sense out of those 30 first steps and in what order to take them and and if we're really lucky we're able to give them housing from which to do that um, so we already know that we need six more was it six more just six more. just to take care of this waiting list so we'll look at uh, the entire waiting list and we'll see exactly how many more we need and we will get on those and uh, we appreciate everyone's work and thank you all so much I'm, I'm I'm looking around I'm seeing so many people that have inspired me uh, along the way and and really have helped me to to again you know feel feel good about myself I when I was younger, I felt really, really good about myself. Probably wasn't much of a reason to, but, <laughs> but, but I did. And, uh, and now there is a, a reason to, and there is something to 
strive for, and, and I give you my word that I will spend the rest of my life here trying to earn this incredible honor. So thank you very much. Thank you, Tom, for all you do to make Portland a better place. We look forward to working with you for many years to come. We do have a small token of our appreciation, a, a picture of Thomas Heights here for you to take back with you. Um, we've come to the end of our program. In closing, I guess I, I want to, you know, just give a special thanks to our residents, the residents who might be here with us today for allowing this intrusion. Um, and I thank all of you for being with us and celebrating with us today. We appreciate your support and your partnership. Thank you so much.